So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, uh, for this event titled Interviewing the Interviewers, the Nena Sagil Interviews, which uh, is organized in conjunction with the exhibition uh, Proto Para, Rethinking Curatorial Work, uh, specifically for the section on uh, uh, Nena Sagil. We are fortunate this afternoon to gather uh, a stellar lineup of uh, practitioners from different fields, from different fields who had the good fortune to uh, interview uh, Nena Sagil. We have uh, the filmmaker and film historian Nikki Ocampo, the uh, historian Ambeth Ocampo, and the uh, artist and critic uh, Sid Reyes. Uh, a bit of a background on Nena Sagil. Um, uh, let me share a slide. A last slide show. So, uh, Nena Sagil, <clears throat> Nena Sagil was born in uh, nineteen. Was born in nineteen fourteen and completed her fine arts education at the UP in the thirties uh, alongside uh, Anita Magsaysay Ho, with a scholarship from the Walter Damrosh Organization in nineteen fifty four. She studied at the Ecole des Arts. American at the Palais du Fontainebleau in Paris. She later went to the Académie de la Grande Chaumière, uh, where she was mentored by the surrealist uh, Henri Goetz, uh, originally an American uh, who moved around the circles of Hans Hartung, uh, Raoul Ubach, and Maria Helena Vieira da Silva. So this is a, a and a clipping of Nena with, uh, with the Professor Goods. Sagil's first one-person exhibition in Paris was uh, organized by Galerie Cruz in 1957. She also exhibited in the galleries of Susan Duconang beginning in 1965 and in international exhibitions like the Biennale Hispano-Americana de Arte in 1954 in Havana, the Paris Biennale in 1961, and the Salon de la Sacre et de Realité Spirituelle at the Musée de l'Art Moderne in Paris in 1965, and the 7th Salon International Paris Sud in Juvisy in 1966, among others. She died in Paris at the Hôpital Tonon in 1994. So I just would like to show some works of, of, of Nena uh, uh, before she went into full-blown abstraction. So this is uh, uh, images uh, for uh, context. No? Uh, like Hernando Ocampo, Nena was uh, uh, one of the few who uh, modernists who were able to traverse the shift from uh, post-impressionism to neorealism and on to abstraction. So these are, uh, this is an example of that movement from uh, post-impressionism to abstraction, Nena's uh, articulation of that would be in, in this form. And we also see that uh, a very in, interesting shift from uh, uh, the post-impressionism uh, promoted by Idades to an abstraction that they call non-objective art uh, in the 50s in the, in the Philippines. So this is uh, already the abstract phase of, uh, of uh, Nena, and these are images from the monograph on Nena by, by the critic Leonidas Benesa. He, Nena was uh, anthologized in the important uh, compendium Art, uh, Art Abstre, uh, uh, one of the few uh, Asians who, who, who was part of that anthology. And uh, at the Pompidou, there is a uh, collection of some of the images uh, of Nena's works, uh, yeah, I think around eight of them. And uh, at, the, uh, at the Paris archives of the National Collection, I saw four uh, works uh, in the collection of the uh, of French government. So uh, the exhibition at the Vargas uh, focuses uh, on the interviews. We have five interviews of, of Nena. And this one is from Archipelago Magazine in 1977. 
uh, there was one also earlier in for solidarity uh, magazine uh, journal uh, in 1968 and then Ambeto Ocampo uh, kindly uh, <clears throat> shared his uh, transcript of uh, of inter of her in of his interview with Nena in 1984, and here we see uh, the image of Ambet with Nena and uh, Ophelia Helbeson Teki. Uh, this is the uh, uh, page from pages from the transcript and uh, of that interview, and also uh, uh, Nena wrote Ambet some letters. So this is also another <laughs> exhibition: the letters of Nena to to Ambet. And then the, the, the interview of uh, Sid Reyes uh, with Nena Sagil, uh, which was recorded in audio and printed in, uh, in uh, uh, the uh, book, uh, Conversations on Philippine Art, uh, published by the Cultural Center of the Philippines. And the film, the documentary of Nick de Ocampo called uh, titled A Dew Philippine, uh, which focuses on uh, Nena Sagil and uh, Macario Vitalis, among other artists, Filipino artists in France. So I just would like to leave the, I mean, to end the, uh, the, the brief uh, short slideshow with this quote from Nena, when, I mean, in one of the interviews, she said that style, what is it? I wish to make it clear that if I paint, I do in my own way in the spirit and the sentiment of the present. So I am very drawn to that phrase, the spirit and the sentiment of the present. So now we go to the uh, conversation uh, with the interviewers. We'd like to begin with Sid Reyes. So Sid, uh, you have uh, uh, around 15 minutes to share the uh, context of your interview with, uh, with Nena. See that the floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me clear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the first time I saw the works of uh, Nena Sadi was in the late uh, 60s, a long, long time ago. I cannot now recall whether it was at the Solidarity Galleries but I am pretty sure it was not at the Lewis Gallery, then along Edsa in the Luxem building. But uh, I do recall there were, there were uh, paintings with circles as a theme and, and the device to create uh, what seemed to be cosmic uh, scapes, to use a phrase. There were circles and more circles and really never ending circles spinning around in a variety of configurations. I have to be honest and humble enough to uh, uh, admit that at that time in the late 60s, I, I, I knew nothing. I knew nothing about art, except that I enjoyed looking at paintings and, uh, and I was truly intrigued by the mystery of the creative act. At that time, um, I had not had the benefit of any art appreciation class uh, it was not part of the uh, liberal arts uh, curriculum at my school. Uh, I won't mention the name of the school. <laughs> 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 so beyond the uh, obvious cosmic allusions, uh, I just want to give um, our listeners who, are, who I presume are mostly millennials. I don't think uh, at that time, during our time, uh, the public uh, knew much about the meaning of Sagil's works. It was, uh, uh, and here let, let me just give a kind of a background in the, uh, of, of the art situation at that time. Uh, it, it was thanks uh, largely to what I call the uh, triumvirate of Philippine art criticism that the public turned to for some enlightenment. <clears throat> this uh, triumvirate was composed of uh, Emmanuel, nicknamed Eric, Torres, Leonidas, or Leo Bonessa, and Dr. Rod Palasperos. The other one I remember was actively writing then was uh, Alfredo Rosas. He was a painter himself, 
and he for years wrote the long running column in the old um, Manila Times. Uh, the name of this column was Races and Thorns. And uh, Manila Times was a publishing company owned by the Roses plan. But uh, back to the Korean way. Uh, it was Professor Eric Torres who, who, who was then teaching at the at the Mary University, and he was, by the way, also the uh, curator of the uh, Atomary Art Gallery. Uh, Professor Torres wrote, uh, I believe, in the late 60s until the end of the until about 1970, consistently, a column called Way of Seeing, uh, and, and which I followed uh, really devotedly. I was, by, by way of reading the writings of Eric Torres, I, I was not aware that I myself was being drawn to, uh, to the practice of art writing. Anyway, uh, Professor Torres always wrote uh, glowingly of the works of Mona Sagi. Professor Torres was, you know, uh, and this may not be known to the millennial generation listening, Professor Torres was one of the best poets in the country then, in my estimation. And um, his lyrical way of uh, handling uh, the language naturally graced and infused his art criticism. As a critic, Professor Torres was fearless and I have to say, often ruthless. He could be as effusive in his place as he did with Mona Sagri, but Professor Torres did also build a lacerating and bruising and legal judgment which he inflicted on artists, one of which was Oscar Salameda. Poor Salameda, of course, was a darling of the collecting coterie. His uh, Salameda's jet setting lifestyle certainly polished his image as a sophisticated man, rise to the ways of the world, and groom in the social graces of the elite. This uh, image of Salameda uh, was very attractive to Manila's uh, high society. But on Nina Sadio, uh, it was a panel that Professor Torres lavished, and I use the word. <laughs> Correctly, love is all the poetic elegance of uh, of his uh, language. Indeed, Professor Torres eventually uh, wrote a monograph on the art of Mona Sagil in conjunction with an exhibition of Sagil's Sagil's work at the Ateneo Art Gallery in 2003. Now, of Mona Sagil, the person, the artist, uh, at that time, one knew little about her then. It was only much later that uh, uh, her name is always associated with the word ex expatriate and also with the city of Paris. Uh, and when the local media mentioned the word expatriate, a word which they seem to have fallen in love with, the names of Sanso and Medalia are almost always mentioned. Only years later with the name uh, Othelia Herbazan Teki, will be attached to the names Sanso and Sagil. Uh, there was another expatriate Filipino artist uh, to whom uh, the word expatriate was always attached. Uh, his name did not ring a bell at all, for he was not uh, Paris-based, but in fact he was, uh, uh, he, he, he secluded himself in a distant town called Preston Le Grove, located in uh, Brittany in the northern northern <laughs> region of France. His name was Macario Vitalis, an Ilocano born in the Locust Hill, and only now after many years, since his death in 1990, does the name Macario Vitalis ring a bell. Indeed, not, not just the bell uh, uh, of memory, but ring the bell of the cash register of the auction houses. The word expatriate evoked a noble and romantic image. After all, in the 60s, traveling outside the Philippines was not so common, not so common at all. Uh, all you know, the rich people of Manila you know, just went to Hong Kong and, 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 and uh, New York, but it was a very limited uh, uh, number of Filipinos who had the privilege of a, of a luxurious jet-setting lifestyle. 
and always it meant uh, uh, traveling to the U.S. It was a period of time before the great uh, migration of our overseas workers. But Europe as a continent was a mystery, if not a cipher, to many Filipinos. All one knew of the city of Paris was the image of the Eiffel Tower and the movies of a French actor named Maurice Chevalier and the actress Leslie Caron. Uh, can I hold on for a while? Are you okay, Sid? Can, you, can I hold on for a while? There's something going on wrong. Okay, okay. Uh, you want to stop now, Sid? If you want to stop now, I'll, I will just explain uh, much yeah. later. Okay, then, okay. Uh, the Thanks. next speaker. Okay, thank over, you. Yeah. Thank you, Sid. Thank you. Uh, we, we now move to Amber for his recollection of, of Nena uh, and he, the context of the interview that he organized uh, in Paris. So Ambet, the floor is yours. Okay, first of all, I want to thank Patrick for the invitation to speak today and thank actually you. to thank him uh, a little bit more simply because the pandemic actually caused uh, uh, us to look into ourselves and see, you know, see mortality. Um, so in the beginning of the pandemic, I had to fix my library, uh, open files, throw away, you know, a lifetime of accumulated junk. And I realized I just have to fix uh, my papers because when I die, my, uh, my sisters will probably just throw everything away. So I, I did everything, including uh, the slideshow for my funeral, you know, because I wouldn't trust my nieces to choose you know pictures that i want to be remembered in and uh, one of the things one of the files that came out were files uh from 1984. uh this was a year before i started writing and um, they were transcribed interviews i was very energetic at the time uh, still an undergrad student and um, when I was in Paris in 84, I had interviewed uh, Nena Sagil, Macario Vitalis, and Juvenal Sanso. So this was the time when I was, uh, I don't know, I was uh, probably inspired by the late Doreen Fernandez's work on oral history. I just kept uh, meeting people, taping them, uh, transcribing interviews, something which I won't do anymore. So it was rather serendipitous that uh, I was chatting with Patrick and said, you know, can I send you some things? So I met Nena Sagil in 84. I was introduced by Ophelia Teki. I was just curious. Um, I knew what her work was like, and uh, I just wanted to meet the person behind all these little circles uh, artwork. Uh, and we became fast friends. So I used to visit her uh, many times. Uh, I would never see her at work though. I had wanted to see her at work, but I wanted to see artists in their studios. So I, I'm hoping that uh, Patrick will be able to unearth from the UP archives that has uh, my papers, um, a bundle of photographs I took of her studio, um, uh, her desk and uh, what it looked like. But just to let you know what it was like, uh, you, it, it, it was, she lived in a, in, a, in a tiny street of Saint-Germain-des-Prés, a very nice area of Paris, uh, in, a, in a street called Rue de Ciso, the, the, the Scissors uh, Street. And she lived in like a little attic, so you would have to go in through a very small um, winding staircase. And when you went up, you would see all the works. Actually, she didn't sell very much. So you would see all the paintings all wrapped up all the way up to when you get upstairs. So it was a very small space, almost monastic, you would, you would think. It was a bed, a desk, a small table to eat, and a, and a fridge and a stove and uh, more paintings wrapped up. You know, she would tell me that she would be sending things to her sister, uh, but there were some things that were, um, that were hanging. Um, one nice uh, watercolor, which I now have, 
called the tunnel, which she exhibited in Solidaridad in 68. Uh, she had a, a small portrait of her sister. Um, it was a figurative work, uh, Victoria. And then she had two small, um, it, they were like, she put them, she, she, she sewed them, no, um, canvases, and uh, she made two circle things. Uh, the, the iconic work, the island in the Ateneo is a large round thing, and she made a small one, which she, which she gave to me, so two of these. And uh, at the time that I was visiting her, she painted a, self, a series of self-portraits, uh, four self-portraits, uh, which were made in, uh, there was a uh, spring, summer, autumn and winter. So her in four different stages of life in four different uh, phases. So it was it was quite interesting to uh, to visit her. She she would tell me that she would often work in the evening and sleep during the day. Or at least she woke up late around 10, 11, uh, because it was quiet when she would work. And one of the legends, which I never really got to confirm, uh, was that she would start working in the early evening, start drawing her circles, and by the time she looks up, it's it's the dawn of a new day. You know? So she would work continuously. Um, uh, the other thing that was uh, that that made me well, two two things. Um, one day she invited me to eat dinner there. She says, "Let's you know, let's we we talked so much, we talked for hours." So she says, "Stay for dinner." So I said, "Okay, fine." And dinner for us. So as she opened the fridge, there was one egg, there was a tub of chocolate yogurt, and uh, half a loaf of old bread. So she scrambled the egg. We split that. We split the tub of. Um, tub of yogurt and split the, the, the bread. And uh, when my father heard about this, he was so upset. He says, never eat in her house again. Uh, and he says, every time you go to Paris, I'll give you money and you take her out to eat in a nice restaurant. So we would go out, uh, we would eat. Uh, she, I would let her choose, we would eat. And our afternoons were always to go around uh, the galleries in the area, you know, as you would say, one day she says, you know, there's a, an exhibit of book art by artists. You know, uh, we, we saw uh, an exhibit of a young guy named Botero uh, and the, uh, they, they, were, they were drawings, which were, you know, $100 each, $200. And now, now I regret you know, the things that we used to see in the 80s uh, before the art market became the crazy thing that it was today. But that was the thing about uh, Nena Sagil. She, she didn't really think about selling. Uh, she just painted and painted and painted. And, you know, now that we think about, say, y Yayoi Kusama and the circles, when you think about it, Nena Sagil had actually predated her. But that's the, the thing about art and the art market. It's, uh, it's luck, you know. Um, Nena was not very outgoing. She was, uh, again, very monastic. And uh, she just painted and painted. And we just hope that um, one day we will find out all the things that she she painted uh, after she died most of the things were shipped home but some things were left behind no i i remember she painted on her cabinet she painted on her telephone her stool so uh it was it was uh, entering into another world and um i'm glad that uh, i was able to dig out this 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 forgotten interview and um see and i hope patrick will find uh, some use for this not only for this but also for the for the letters that she wrote because she wanted me to curate her 1990 retrospective show which did not push through because by the 1990s uh she was sort of uh, command, uh, there was a cordon sanitaire by Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, each time I called, it would be somebody who would answer. They would never give her the phone. So in the 90s, I had lost touch. You know? So even the letters uh, stopped stopped coming. So, But uh, it was interesting because in her last year, she had already thought out how she wanted to be remembered. She arranged all the artworks into phases, uh, which will make Patrick's work uh, easy because she already talks about how she moved from uh, making you know her version of Amor Solo works. You know her early works. You know she has a nice picnic scene like an Amor Solo, uh, and then they made went into circles and how it slowly became the circles became faint and faint until she says you know the the, the object was to create abstraction and abstraction for her was to have nothing 
and it's not just leaving an empty piece of paper it's actually drawing some some things uh circles such that you create the emptiness of, of space. Uh, it was a very cerebral uh, kind of art. And uh, I hope that in these days, uh, we will remember Nena Sagil and hopefully get her uh, in as one of the national artists uh, of the Philippines. So just that. Thank yeah. you. I think she deserves to be the first woman, no? Yes, yes. I'm in visual arts to, to be honored with that, uh, with that award. Uh, very. Uh, so it was a wonderful sharing, um, Beth, and we can talk more about it later uh, after the others have spoken. So we, we move on with the sharing of uh, Nick Di Ocampo. So Nick, the floor is yours. But if Sid would like to speak first and finish his presentation, that will be okay. Uh, it's okay with me. Uh, I if think... Sid wants to speak first. So maybe Nick, you, 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 you do it, yeah, and then okay. we'll just, uh, and All we'll, right, so yeah. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, uh, my share here is um, uh, to uh, relate to you the experience I had um, when I was a student in Paris in 1981. So I was a film student, and I had to come up with uh, a thesis film. And uh, before I left the Philippines, uh, Virgin Moreno, the poet, uh, told me that, look, there are uh, expatriate painters, all right, uh, artists in uh, Paris, and uh, you might want to look for them, and uh, you might want to consider uh, making a film on them, which I did. So I think I first met Nena in a function in the embassy, because it was going towards December uh, mm -hmm. when we reached, uh, when I was uh, there in Paris, uh, uh, it was around December, and so there was this party, and then I got to know uh, Nena, Ofi. Uh, so, uh, but because Ofi, uh, uh, Helbi Sonteki, is from Iloilo, where my family comes from, and so we talk in our uh, language, in our uh, Hiligaynon, and then later on would tell me chismis, all right? <laughs> very, very Pinoy, no? Would chismis, ito si yan, 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 okay. So uh, I, I think I, she introduced me to Nena, and then I was able to tell them that I wanted to make a film on them, which uh, they granted. And so um, the thing with uh, Nena is, tama yung sabi ni Ambeth Ngabale, when you go to her house, all right, you go through this um, spiral staircase, and uh, almost uh, all around the walls, and dudoon yung mga paintings there, which were concentric and pastel. So that I will never forget. So while I was go going up Ngabale, ascending, you know, I had this, this feeling of going up as if I, I was going to heaven. There was already an ambiance, of, uh, uh, an atmosphere that you already feel. She already set you up. Because I think her, her, um, her loaf is on the third floor uh, uh, in uh, saint germain des Prés, all right? And then uh, as you enter that, there's still an inner court. And then you go up to that winding stairs. And as I said, you're already set up to meet Nena Sagil, the monastic hermetic figure that she was because of the um, uh, ambience that the paintings have given you as you go through that winding stair. And then the moment you reach there, the door is all painted also <laughs> with concentric circles. So the packaging was just complete for me. And then she opens the door and there is this frail woman all right, in her painterly, uh, uh, well, maybe that's her uh, uniform, all right. Um, and then when you enter, it's a Tamas Ambethulet, napakaliit ng kwarto. It's a one room affair. And it is filled with canvases and canvases and canvases. Some really big ones, and others are illustrations. And again, the next impression was yes, the refrigerator is painted with circles, the chairs, name it name it, everything is all on concentric circles. So that was pretty intriguing. I, I tried to capture that in my film. So I think where I want to go right now is, what was it that Nena Sagil shared with us, you know, in terms of the interview? She talks about spirituality. You see that in the interview, in the Super 8 film that I, inter that I used to interview her. So she talks about spirituality, and then uh, she does this, 
by um, having it in uh, uh, as a, uh, uh, to contrapose the materialism that uh, she sees all around. All right, and therefore she would rather live a monastic life. All right, seldom she goes out, but you know, you must know uh, um, Saint Germain de Pre is um, you know it's a kind of an upscale uh, community with a lot of uh, perfumeries and. Uh, Boulangerie and uh, cafes. Oh, uh, uh, Le Café uh, de Du Magots is there. The very famous, uh, anong abale, no? uh, the Saint Germain Church is there. McDonald's is almost right in, across her street. So all of this, she wants to shut herself off from all of this and then retreat into her spiritual world. And these are all the concentric circles. And then you will see that she, she keeps describing it as a kind of a landscape. Well, I think Tama si, um, si Sid Kanina, it's a cosmic landscape, all right? And she had to pay the price in doing that. It is correct, again, to say that she would work in the evening with her very small lamp. She would make those dots. But what destroyed her eyes were really the ink, the ink and paper. It's not her murals. It's not her big paintings. She painted this, um, uh, it's more of a, a, an ink drawing, still again with dots, creating those circles then her eyes failed her. But because she was Jehovah's Witness, she cannot be, she doesn't want her body to be touched, to go undergo surgery. Until somehow, you know, she was able to rest her eyes, regained her sight again. But for her, it was like a second life and then another burst of energy again for her. So having said that, uh, she is really um, very spiritual in her art. However, she brought out some scientific photographs, which surprised me. She brought out some scientific photographs, and there it was, photographs of the galaxy and, uh, and the universe and everything. And I said, oh my God, could it be that, you know, outside of what she claims to be spiritual source, that she is seeing all of these circles, there is a very scientific image of the galaxy and of the universe and then i said i don't know kayo nalang maghusga magaling kayo as critics and all that pero sa akin nagulat ako sabi ko ano ito parang may batayan ba is this something that you know where she could uh, another source of her inspiration i leave it at that because the um, similarity was so uncanny was so uh, was so close that it almost bothered me but i said well maybe that's her source um, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, really uh, more about her, um, well, personal life. When she was there, her sister Victoria uh, was there already, all right? She also treated me to dinner. Well, you had bread, old bread. What you had was she just boiled uh, the noodles, all right, the spaghetti, and then that's what we shared, the three of us, Victoria, Nena, and myself. I don't even remember if it had sauce in it, all right? I don't even remember if there was sauce. It's, it's that, you know, sure it was bland, but the food was not, well, at that time important for me because the conversation was just going on. Thank God we had wine. And I think while we were talking, I, I got so drunk. I dropped my camera when I stood up, all right? Because we were so engaged, we were so... Nena was really a personality, but I guess uh, uh, one takeaway I really had with her was uh, that uh, she was very deep. I mean, she would talk about spirituality most of the time. I could not really engage her in other discussions, uh, but uh, just more of that. The last time I met Nena was in New York, 1989. So I was again a student, all right. I was taking up my uh, uh, master's uh, of ma master of arts degree at uh, New York University, and then I uh, heard from the embassy that there's an exhibit of Nena Sagil in the um, in the embassy, and so I went there, and as I entered the uh, the hallway, I saw her at one corner, and then suddenly she stood up. Of course, I felt honored that oh my God, Nena remembers me. However, she might have remembered my face. But what she said was, Roberto, 
I said, I, I mean, who is Roberto? I mean, so maybe if that's how he re she remembered me that suddenly I became Roberto, all right, then so be it, you know? So with the embassy officials, I was saying, sabi na, naku, baka boyfriend niya si Roberto, <laughs> okay? And so um, uh, there it was, her, uh, all her paintings of concentric circles and everything was there. Um, and um, as I left the hallway, I saw her again uh, at the end of that uh, hallway. And I just have this image of her, you know, so imprinted in my mind, a small woman, a fragile woman, and yet how prodigious, how prolific, and how spiritual she was as uh, a person, and I guess as an artist. That's it. Thank you, Nix. It's a great sharing. I will <laughs> return to you later, okay? And I'd like to... Uh... Uh, inform the audience that if you have questions you can put in the uh, in our fb uh, uh, chat section or whatever however you call it not just and then we can uh, pitch them to the, uh, to the to the panelists so maybe we can now uh, go back to sid sid are you okay to speak uh, uh, we are also excited to learn about the context of your interview with nena <laughs> Yeah. Maybe I can uh, talk about the context uh, in the QA answer, but I think just to sum up the, the this thing of um, reminiscing about Nena, it would be nice, I think, if we if the uh, listeners would hear the actual words spoken by uh, by Sagil, uh, as because my book Conversations on Philippine Art has has been so long out of print. Uh, for which, in a way, I'm grateful because I was told by the publishers that the students snapped up all the copies for their term papers. So I would like to share some of the quotations that um, Sagil, by the way, is a, is a very quotable uh, person, interviewer. But you just have to know how to ask the proper question. Like, uh, and just to go back to the paintings, I asked uh, Miss Sagil, how did you get, uh, how did you start uh, on all those blue paintings, uh, those blue cellular paintings of varying tones, you must have done nearly every possible shade of blue. Why blue, I, I asked. And, and, and she would answer in a very uh, crisp way, but it's complete. It's not, uh, it's not rudely brusque. It's it's so poetic. It, everything has been uh, weighed, okay. And her answer to me was, to my question was, I did not choose it. I felt it. I'm very intuitive, but intuitive only, in the sense that the mind has foretold what the hand should do. I thought that was a brilliant, brilliant um, uh, comment of which much can be said. It, it, you know, it, it's, it's a term paper in its own right. And then I ask her, what, what is this instinct that artists uh, talk about? Is it uh, the same as having a sixth sense? And Miss Agel said, and, and, and I think she mentioned the name of the artist, the Russian artist, who I believe, without a doubt, was the most um, crucial, uh, significant influence on her art. And the artist is, of course, uh, uh, Vasily Kandinsky. And Miss Sagil answered, it is what Kandinsky calls le nécessité intérieure, the necessity to express your inner self to your work, to be true to this inner self and not to fight it. It is a voyage into the absolute, a search for the ideal. The things that you see are mere accidents of the feelings made manifest by the mind, the spirit, through the medium of your hands. I thought, wow, that's nice. That's really wonderful. Then uh, I asked her, because uh, as a practicing painter myself, uh, I, I asked some questions that are really geared towards the act of painting. So I asked her, how do you know when something is wrong with the painting? Does intuition play a part in this too? And Miss Agil answered, I know something is wrong by the disharmony in a painting. Painting is just like music. I think all the arts are the same. It's only the medium that is different. Each of the art reinforces the other. Listening to Bach, for example, 
makes you aware of the discipline and spirituality of music. These are things you can apply to painting. Before, she said, I used to start the day by reading poetry while taking my coffee. This was a habit for many years, but now it's music. I want music while I'm painting. I find it very stimulating. It helps in creating harmony in my work. And of course, as Ambet and Nick have shared with you, when you walk, when you enter a small uh, space, both living area, dining area, studio, with tons and tons and tons of works uh, piled on, on papers and on the walls. So I had to make a, a very obvious question. I said, uh, Miss Pagi, you seem like an indefatigable worker. The incredible number of drawings you have done here affects to the prodigious energy. Each one is so minutely detailed. Don't you find doing these drawings tedious? And Miss Tiger answered, long hours of work do not bother me. I never get bored. If I do, I have no business doing them. In drawing, I just let the lines flow. I let them flow lyrically. These are intuitive lines. And so I asked, you know, like in the parish of your interviews, uh, what is your painting schedule? Do you paint every day? And she answered very uh, to the point. I, yes, I paint every day. That much is definite. And then, you know, this is something that interviewers have to uh, be careful with uh, because uh, there are some questions that you may ask or may not ask. Some questions may sound uh, indelicate. I mean, we, in the 60s, in the 70s, we were not living in the age of uh, Boyabunda, okay? Uh, we, 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 we could not just ask questions. We, we, were, we were people of good breeding. We could have just blurt out insensitive, indelicate, suggestive questions the way we do now. Um, but I think the, because, because that was the age of the, you know, the, uh, the people generation, the San Francisco thing, when LSD was at the height of it. So it was the only question that I dared answered, uh, asked rather, uh, Miss Aguilar. So I said, do you take drugs and use this mind-blowing drawings? And I held my breath. It was very uh, spontaneous in, in her answer and definite. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. I do not need them. I have my own natural means of getting high. Many artists take drugs and other artificial stimulants like alcohol to create this paradis artificial. What a beautiful sound the French phrase makes. <laughs> In English, we would say artificial paradise, but the French say the paradis artificial. And it sounds so different as if, you know, it's an another world uh, uh, kind of language. And she continues, artists like Baudelaire and Rambo need this artificial stimulation so they could write. There's another artist who does this, a contemporary one. His name is Michaud, Henri Michaud. Uh, and, and if you Google, if you go to the YouTube, you can watch tips, I believe, of uh, Henri Michaud doing very exhibitionistic uh, work, you know, um, abstract expressionist, but very, very theatrical, very, very, very showy. And uh, Miss Agas, his name is Michaud. He is doctor too, interesting, huh? A doctor taking uh, artificial stimulants. And uh, Sagio continues, he is doctor too, so he should know what he is doing. But a doctor friend attends to him, waiting outside the room, while Michel is doing his paintings under the influence of some drug. He was, he was very, uh, Michel was very rational. He had to make sure that somebody's waiting outside the door just in case things go wrong. And I think he did it very properly. And uh, so being so uh, such, in such a high state, uh, when she's painting, I had to ask the question, Miss Sagil, when confronted by a really terrific painting, what's the feeling like for you? And she was, and this is where 
people get the sense of uh, she sounds very mystical. It's almost like a religious. Uh, you know, she's, she's like going into a kind of uh, about to levitate, you know. And she says, Miss Aga says, I am moved. I am touched. Yeah. I get a physical thrill and uplifting of the spirit. It's like a religious experience. And lastly, of course, uh, I could not help uh, ask, you know, because Paris is a, is a city of the great artists, you know. And, you know, uh, like in our age, everybody goes crazy when they meet celebrities, and, you know. Uh, it was the same with artists uh, at that time as well. And so uh, I said, Did, have you had any experience? Uh, have you ever met any of these great names? Uh, because Buhay Pasila, the great artists were Buhay pa at that time. So, uh, as I said, I was very fortunate to have met uh, Moshu Matisse. Matisse, yeah. So the, for the students, go, go and research. This was in November 1954. 1954 was the year, I believe, when Miss arrived in Paris. Uh, he died the following year. I was with a group of students of Professor Goetz, who was her professor. Matisse was already bedridden, but he was still working on collages. A nurse was helping him with the scissors and paper. I remember him saying, he will not be happy unless he is painting. So I asked uh, Miss Sagel, what, was, what do you think was the great, one great quality of Matisse that impressed you? And Miss Sagel said, humility. I think the greater the artist becomes, the humbler he gets. And I just want to backtrack a bit on the, on the Parisian scene when Miss Sagel, because I, I got to mention November 1954, the year when she arrived in, in, in Paris. And she said, uh, and I asked her, what attracted you to Paris in the first place? And she said, I, I was magnetized by the city. It was everything I had read about in books, and every artist I know has always been attached to Paris. I came here in 1954, uh, and I have always lived here, except for a year in 1958, uh, when I left for Spain, Rome, and the United States. When I came back from that trip, I decided to stay in Paris, and I have never left. After 14 years of residence, uh, but by the way, this interview was held, I think, in 1974, okay? So long ago. After 14 years of residence in the city, I went to visit Manila, and I was homesick for Paris all the time. Isn't that amazing? So I asked her, I mean, it's not easy being an exile, you know, uh, at that time. And, 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 and like today where you have relatives all over the place and you, somebody will always uh, help. So I asked her, don't you feel like an exile here? Being among people of a different race and language? Miss Tuggle was really had no feeling of such anxiety. She said, no, I do not feel like an exile here. Besides, in time, you learn to speak the French language. And even if you are not an artist, people here will not make you feel like an exile. Lastly, I, I will quote for me a very important thing, because if there are artists listening uh, right now, uh, something that we should all try to keep in our mind. Uh, and I ask her, you say you do not uh, feel like an exile in Paris but do you still have that oriental feeling in you? And Miss Agil answered, I think you feel more oriental here because of the perspective of distance from your own country. And this feeling of yourself as an oriental always shows in your work. Your roots will always be expressed in anything you do. The Filipino and the artist will always show up in his work. And listen to this. It will show even through his own insecurity. I think we are too conscious of being Filipino. The important thing is sincerity. Why should I imitate the French? I am answerable only to myself. Therefore, one must free oneself within oneself. You can be influenced by foreign elements, whether you stay home in Manila or here in Paris. It has nothing to do with being abroad it is all a matter of one's integrity. Those were the words of Ms. Nena Sagil. Thank you. Thank you, Sid, for sharing those words. Uh, we have now received some questions from the audience. And 
I'd like to uh, go through them. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, but before that, I have a question. Uh, the the idea of the Filipino uh, identity of the Filipino came up already through that quote from Sid. I was wondering if uh, the idea the the question of gender uh, uh, was brought to the fore in in your conversation with uh, with Nena. So Ambet, would you like to start? Was it did it matter that she you know did she feel that her being a woman in Paris, uh, a Filipino woman artist in Paris, was a uh, something uh, you know that shaped her practice? or the reception to her practice? Yeah, I, uh, she was very, uh, I mean, she found Paris very liberating. Um, I guess compared to the post-war Philippines, it was quite liberating. Um, Sid actually says that there were questions she, we would not ask because it's not boy abunda. But I mean, uh, Nena was very forthright. She would talk about many things. Uh, you wouldn't have asked her about gender or uh, because the, the way that she made, she composed herself, she was always simply dressed. Actually, she looked like a nun no? uh, without a veil. So you would not, but she would, she would actually talk about a lot about these things. No? Um, she, she felt that it was in Paris that she rediscovered or felt the Oriental in her. I guess uh, coming from the post-war Philippines, about, they were very Americanized. And then here, uh, and it's, it, was, it was critics who were reading things into her work that made her see, ah, yeah, you know, this is the Oriental in me. Sometimes it was something that she didn't really think about, uh, but it was the critics who opened her eyes to uh, what was in her work that maybe she did not even think of or, or uh, do on purpose. No? Uh, uh, Sid also mentioned something about taking drugs. Uh, th there's one part where Nena actually was taking eye drops uh, for uh, her eyes and uh, it produced uh, psychedelic uh, uh, things. And she said, no, I would enjoy just looking at the, the circles that I would see because of the eye drops, but th that did not go into my work. She says, what goes into my work comes from another another source so uh it came mm -hmm. from within it was it was not something that came from her eye drops or other things yes it, it was not ophthalmology no? yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay uh so uh nick uh, any thoughts on the gender question you know what it never came up uh with us i mean uh all the time i really thought that the whole idea of uh uh, her not being gendered, you know, I mean, uh, it's, there really was no, um, no issues about her sexuality. She can do it, uh, that she's an artist. And the time that uh, I shared with her in Bali, it was really more on the, in the realm of spirituality. So it's beyond any material, yeah. you know, uh, idea of herself being... In a, in a certain mortal form, but rather, you know, she she was all uh, pretty intellectual, pretty spiritual, um, and uh, I don't know, I'm Beth, if you remember it, but there's because the the room was so small, uh, there was really no place for a woman to have all her vanities, you know. Uh, yeah. All the time that I would see her, she. She would wear the same Russian hat, yeah. hat that she, she has. She wears the same um, coat that she puts right at the back yeah. of, uh, of the door, uh, the same set of gloves. And uh, of course, I mean, it was just three months that I was coming in and out. Mm -hmm. And I said, Is, are these all, you know, that she has? Yeah. Uh, again, I, I like Sid, I wouldn't want to ask. I mean, maybe I was too <laughs> young then too also to ask, you know, about gender <laughs> questions. Um, Hindi pa ako ganun kamulat, no? So, uh, no, it did not uh, really um, uh, come up in our, in our mm. talk. I did ask her, though, about marriage, no? Uh, because once <laughs> she told me about the boyfriend, no? Uh, so, uh, somebody who proposed to her and said that I can make you famous and uh, come with me to New York, and she, she dumped him right away. So at one point, I asked, how come you never got married? Uh, mm. And... Uh, her answer was something that stuck with me, you know, a, a long time. She says, you know, um, 
if I'm alone, I am whole. If I am married, I am half. Uh, I mean, it was that kind of uh, thing. No? If I may share. That's very quotable. Huh? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it, uh... Viral yan, viral. Oh. Okay, uh, Sid, yeah, I'd like to uh, chime in. Yes, you know, at, at that time, exactly, I think in the early 70s, uh, th there was a, um, a landmark essay, a, a groundbreaking essay, uh, written by American historian uh, by the name of Linda Nocklin. And the title was very provocative. Uh, and the title is, is in the form of the interrogative, and it's Why Are There No Great Women Painters? Uh, so, where is the female Picasso? Where is the female Pollock? But uh, Nocklin uh, uh, went to the history of uh, women artists. Uh, it's a long, long essay. You can all uh, Google it. I think the text is available. It's downloadable. And, you know, it, it, uh, it, it starts with uh, essentially the problem of, uh, you know, you talk gender and the, and the purpose of being a woman, which, you know, in past history was really the, the, the you know, the procreation and the ruling of, um, of the race, you know. And so there were all uh, the women were, uh, had to do all the uh, work domestically and they had to take second um, Way behind the husband who was destined or deemed to be the, the breadwinner. So it, it went through a lot of reasons why history has been uh, unfair to women. Of course, uh, Linda Nocklin also brought up uh, many names of uh, women painters in, through the different centuries uh, who did excellent, excellent work. In fact, if you get to see their works, you would not say that this was done by a woman painter. So so that's uh, by way of going to the historical uh, uh, narrative of, uh, of the role of women painters in history. You know, but, but interestingly, I, uh, I wanted to compare, for instance, the, the, the life of uh, Nena Sagil, who was a, uh, a single person, okay? Uh, who had all the freedom of her single blessedness. And I wanted to contrast her uh, with someone who we didn't wish uh, she showed the same birth year. And, you know, of course, I'm talking about Miss Anita Magsay and Fai Ho. They were both born in, bo born in 1914, I guess. 14, 14, yeah. 14. And, you know, Miss, I also had the fortune of, uh, with fortune of interviewing uh, uh, Miss Anita. Uh, I, I interviewed Sagil in the, you know, in, in that Garrett uh, attic studio which was well described by Ambert and Nick. I also happened to have interviewed Miss Anita in a luxurious sports park living room, okay? So there you can see the contrast between the two lifestyles, yeah? But Miss Anita was a, a, a lady to the bone, you know, uh, with, with tremendous breathing. And, you know, she had the same, she had not, not the same um, lifestyle background, childhood, as uh, uh, Miss Tema, but uh, when she married at, um, Mr. Robert Ho at great sacrifice in quotation marks, as a painter, she was no longer a Filipino, <laughs> uh, but you know, as a housewife married to a very conservative Chinese, uh, Miss Neil told me that she could not paint, she could not paint while the husband and the children were home. She had to do her duties as a, as a mother, as a housewife, as a homemaker, prepare the meals. They were living, I believe, mostly in Hong Kong and later on immigrated to some, from a uh, South American country. But she had to perform the role of a dutiful housewife. And Miss Anita said that I can only start to paint when the children and my husband have all left for the school and for the office. And then as she brings out all the painting Palafernelia, and she paints the whole day. And then, you know, like an alarm bell, at five o'clock, she had to keep all the painting instruments, keep them on the side, out of view, out of sight, as, you know, as the uh, hard working So, this is the role, uh, you know, <laughs> where gender plays a crucial uh, difference between 
uh, having a female Picasso, you know, and, and no female Picasso. So uh, it, 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 gender is, a, you know, it's a subject that is uh, truly, that needs to be explored. Yeah, that's just great insight. Uh, yeah. it, I was also wondering uh, from your interviews, the uh, Nick, Ambeth, and Sid, if he talked, if she talked about the Philippines and how she talked about the Philippines or Philippine art in particular, or maybe her colleagues or her peers. Or I was wondering if she ever talked about the Philippines when you interviewed her and how uh -uh. she talked about it. Uh -uh. Uh, maybe Nick, we can go, we can, you can, uh, you can go with you first. Uh, I, I, I guess I was pretty focused on uh, on Nena and her work, no. So uh, uh, and uh, my knowledge of uh, Philippine art uh, way back in 1981, you know, uh, I had uh, Jack Pilar for my <laughs> humanities mm. class, Valley. So pretty limited, ang aking uh, ano, Although the interest was really there, uh, however. Um, for example, the next thing I wanted, uh, I immediately did after I arrived from Paris, was to make a film on Victorio Idades. Hmm. I guess we only talked about Victorio Idades, but again, very lightly, you know, that uh, she was part of uh, the uh, coterie hmm. of the, the group of uh, 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 kind of a protege of uh, Victorio Idades. So to a certain point, uh, I started to connect Sagil and modernism and the role that Victorio Idades did. And as you know very well, I made a full-length feature. This is one of my very few full-length features, and that's uh, on Victorio Idades and um, uh, modernism in the Philippines, all right? Uh, so um, uh, th that's the only th time that we talked about the uh, Philippine art. My, um, my parang naalaala ako ngayon, na parang bang she really looked at the art scene with much disdain and uh, ito mas more of the 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 the, the um, the body language and the facial language, na para bang, without really going into all details, parang I just have this very faint memory na para she was really not comfortable with the atmosphere in the Philippines and could be the reason why, of course, nag-aral siya ngayon sa, sa Paris. So she was not specific at all. And of course, I didn't know what questions to ask at that time, what made her uncomfortable, unwelcome, etc. And then later on, tinahi ko na lang yan with Victorio Edades. Well, if Victorio Edades came back around 1928, di ba? From, uh, hmm. from New York, I from Washington. Think, yeah. uh, and then he had his uh, show at the Colombian. Eh, uh, grabe ang away niya kay uh, Tolentino at uh, buong, UP, <laughs> buong UP Fine Arts. Grabe yung away niya. So, uh, after thought na lang ito, na baka yan ang nireferred ni, ni Nena noon without going into details that the art scene was really um, inhospitable for abstraction, for growth, and all of those. So, uh, most possibly, uh, I'll end this by saying that with the exception of Victorio Idades, and I took the lead from there. That's why I made a film. I immediately uh, fl flew to uh, Davao and made a uh, Super 8 documentary again which uh, became the basis for the long, uh, long feature film that I did almost 20 years after. So that's the connection that I made. Mm, thank you, Nick. So, uh, Ambet, did you yeah. get yeah. the same impression about... Yeah. For me, uh, kasi I think, mm -hmm. Nena, the Philippines was something that she left behind. Uh, she kept abreast of it, but she was away from it. Um, so, in a sense, well, she was also telling me that when I'm 60 or 70, I will return home. So, it was like she did things in phases. Uh, so, when she left the Philippines, that was one phase of her life. Paris was the middle phase, and she was supposed to come home uh, when she got older. But um, the stories that she would tell me, uh, what she remembered of the Philippines, is usually, you know, PAG. She talked about how she didn't like Amor Solo because he was commercial and how Fabian de la Rosa was too strict and too, too straight for her. Uh, so it's actually the, that, that period of the Philippine Art Gallery when she was, when she was um, exhibiting there, you know, this, this whole movement that was a reaction to the Amor Solo school. That is what she left behind. 
to mm -hmm. to paint what she wanted to paint. Uh, and the Paris phase was was the phase where she would actually go into abstraction because like mm -hmm. her works in the Philippines really, I mean, those almost Amor Solo-esque works, no? uh, figurative works uh, were, were all forgotten when she, when she went to mm -hmm. Paris. No? Which is why it was also significant that at that late time in the, in the mid 80s, when she actually did her self-portraits, the four self-portraits, which are figurative. So that was also uh, totally different because it was always, you know, the circles and the cosmos, but suddenly she did uh, these four mm -hmm. self-portraits went back to the figurative. In the end, actually, and this I did not see anymore, but her last letters to me in the late 80s was she was going into sculpture. Uh, and I didn't reply because I, I thought they were so ugly. Uh, she would use... Um, used uh, tubes, uh, toilet paper tubes, and she would make forms. So I guess it was all in the head, but the execution because of her age uh, wasn't uh, as nice as I would think it was, but it makes you wonder what she would have done. So when she spoke about the Philippines, and this is where I got a lot of PAG gossip, which I won't repeat here, <laughs> uh, you know, what was happening between Tabuena and, and Lid Argilia and what she thought of everyone else, you know, Hernando Ocampo. It's like she didn't like anyone, um, anyone's work. I mean, she liked them as people, but the work she did not, she was not, not I wouldn't say not at home with, but she didn't feel they were uh, uh, the, the thing that she wanted to do. So the Paris face, I think, was the reaction to the Philippines. No? Uh, so she, she spoke about the Philippines very little. When we spoke about the Philippines, it was only to talk about Victoria because the sister oh. had gone home. No? But basically that. Mm -hmm. It's a Victoria and Victoria Edades. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so Sid, yeah, can you weigh in? You know, because uh, because uh, Nick mentioned the name Victoria Edades, whom I, whom I was also able to interview in, in Davao. Uh, the question really, I wanted to ask Professor Edades, but I could not because at that time I was not yet aware really of, uh, of the art scene. Now, if Professor Edades were allowed the, the question I would ask him very directly is, why did you not, why did you not include Nena Sagil yes. in your 13 moderns? Yes. When, and, and this is me speaking now, when, when I asked you, you qualified your choices for the 13 moderns, was you said you wanted artists in whom you first saw the, uh, the signs of modernity. Mm. How could you, Professor Edades, were you blind? Could, not, could you not have seen uh, the modernity of the Sagi? And instead, no offense meant to Bonifacio Cristobal, Arsenio Capulli. The instruction, you know, staring you in the face. And you say you did not see the, the, the face of modernity in the works of Nena Sagi. That is not a flippant question or, or meant to create intrigue. It, it is a serious question. And I feel it's a kind of an injustice injustice to Miss Nena Sagil that she was not um, included in, in that supposed to be prestigious roster. But historically, it exists now and it plays a very important role. Yeah, I, I agree. So it's uh, something to consider. The other question is, there are questions about spirituality. And uh, I was wondering if you could speak to the possible sources of uh, the spiritual thought that uh, Nena expressed, where, where did it come from? Uh, uh, she was, I think, raised as a Catholic in Manila, I could only assume. And then later in her life, she became Jehovah's Witness. And in between, there was this, uh, you know, professions to spirituality. So I was wondering how you could, uh, there, there seems to be a spectrum of the spiritual no? in, in, the, mm. in, in this in this I, I, yeah. biography. So how would you uh, evaluate the, the, you know, this spiritual context of, of, of Nena? I, I think, uh, if I may, I think it was the, really the, the influence of Kandinsky. Yeah. Uh, you know, Kandinsky was, remember, Kandinsky wrote the book on the spiritual, uh, on the spiritual nature of art, something like that. Mm -hmm. 
and the spiritual in art. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, and of course the the subject of the uh, you know clearly in that very uh, we cannot hear you, uh, Sid. Sid, we cannot hear you. If it breaks up, uh, yeah. Now and then, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I believe it's the influence of uh, of Kandinsky who wrote that book on the spirituality of art. Uh, remember, I asked the question of uh, Nena Sagil, uh, where did you get all these blue uh, filters? Now later on, I came across a, a statement from Kandinsky. Uh, by the way, Kandinsky equated a particular emotion, and Kandinsky's answer fell into the blue. The deeper the blue becomes the more strongly it calls man towards the uh, And finally, for the supernatural. The brighter the blue becomes, the more it loses its sound. I have no doubt that the uh, words of Kandinsky is, is, is a great influence on the spirituality uh, of things and evoked by the words of Nenasaki. You, uh, you don't have to guess that because yeah. in in my interviews with her, she mentions Kandinsky repeatedly yeah. and quote and quotes from him. So it's uh, and you could see uh, she, Naina Sagal would talk about the things she read. She read Proust. She read poetry, uh, and she would cite all these authors that she read. But Kandinsky was something that uh, repeatedly came up when she would talk about her art. Yeah. I remember. Mm -hmm. I remember also Nena saying. I don't know if uh, uh, the, uh, she told you this, but she would go to the library, uh, mm -hmm. even in winter. Yeah. No, she would go there. So it's religiously, that's how she schooled herself. Mm -hmm. And what I remember is what there was a stack of paper wherein handwritten, mukang kinokopya niya yung kanya mm -hmm. binabasa. Kasi she talks very intelligently. Yeah. Napaka intelligent ng salita niya at napaka elevated. The vocabulary, and then, of course, yeah. it's in English na mag-uusap kami, no? Pero the point is, this is a well-read woman. So yeah. tama yun, no? Uh, Kandinsky uh, would appear in her conversations often because I think, um, uh, you know, nga, uh, anything that she can read on Kandinsky, on Proust, on, uh, on all of this, you know, uh, all the major uh, po poets and writers maybe, the... You know, I mean, what would she do almost like every day she would go to the library? That's what yeah. she said. Yeah. You know? So I guess uh, she was well-schooled in that or personally schooled. Yeah, she, she actually said that part of her day was actually reading. Yes, uh, she didn't paint go. all the time. No? So I mean, painting was part of it. Well, took yeah. most of the time. But uh, time was always meant uh, to be given to reading and whatever oh. it is. I mean, well, she read the Bible a oh, great yes. deal too. No, so uh, but I think uh, unlike most uh, artists who just paint, uh, this was a very cerebral uh, woman. No, so who actually specifically gave herself reading time, uh, which is which is what fuels the work and yeah. makes her explain the work uh, yes, in the way that yes, she did. Yes, no? yes. But no books could be seen in her house, right? Did oh, you remember? Wala, wala. wala akong nakita ng libro except the Bible. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Asagrado yun, katabi ng uh, bed niya yun. Ng bed shed. Uh, so, it, here's the interesting thing then. Kasi we got so engrossed after we ate that uh, unsauced uh, spaghetti. <laughs> Sabi niya, ay naku, wala ka naman sakyang tren. Why don't you sleep here na lag? Salamat talaga at the judge si Victoria. <laughs> so, I felt... Hindi siya ang dapat mag-feel uh, uncomfortable. Ako. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is a joke, of course. no But suddenly, hindi ang, ang kanyang higaan doon, binigay niya sa akin, at dalawa sila ni Victoria. Kasi dalawa lang mga higaan. Dalawa higaan. higaan. Pa. Magkaganyan pa ang higaan na yon So ako pinatulog na doon sa higaan niya. Of course, hindi ko na kinuha ang kobre kama. And then, andi dito sila magkapatid. Do doon naman sa kabila. So, you know, uh, well, uh, well, I lasted the night. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, she, was, she was very, ano, about uh, yung, uh, things and sexuality. I mean, I, she would always tell me, uh, you know, when David Medalia would come in mm -hmm. and bring his beautiful young boys, uh, Nena Sagil would, you know, feel that parang, <laughs> like David was, 
was flaunting and uh, yeah. showing this to her and so, so parang she was saying is she is he trying to to upset me or to uh, to flaunt this at me but again it's that she was very prim proper parang madre and then david would come with with this beautiful young man no uh, and she would tell me that no um but again she would say it doesn't ma- so, i mean sex to me was it was something that she well she said she had transcended and again but that that's that's the way that she lived no yeah she i think she must have sublimated it so. yeah yeah <laughs> uh, the other question has something to do with recognition both in paris and in in the philippines do you think she was interested to be recognized mm. i mean well, i think it would be it's, I, I you know i think every filipino artist would like to be recognized by his or her own country I think, Sid, we cannot hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, I think it, just don't move a lot because it affects your microphone. Okay. Yeah, just be Can you hear me now? See? Can you? Yes. As be long like, as I don't move a lot. Uh, 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 Sid, be like <laughs> Nena. Be like Nena. So. I, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have to be put on track. Uh, <laughs> just to keep it up. Nakalimutan ko tuloy yung sasabihin ko. <laughs> artists want to be recognized. Yeah, the artists want to be recognized. And you said that every yes. artist wants to be recognized. In, absolutely. Yeah, in absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ako, can I just say, uh, okay. is there truth to to what she claimed? Because I took it just, um, you know, uh, face value. That may isang uh, museum or gallery uh, na pumunta sa kanya at may kinuha ng mga paintings and she was given blank checks. Wow. Wow. I mean, uh, wow. So, uh, uh, kung uh, recognition man ang sinasabi, Patrick, although in a very humble, modest, very quiet way, you know, and only because I uh, maybe I ask uh, almost a similar question like you're asking. So, to a certain point, uh, parang nasabi niya na, you know, uh, there's a gallery, there's uh, somebody who came here, got two of my paintings or maybe more, you know, and I was given blank check. That one I never forgot. Kasi how can an artist be given a blank? Magkano kaya inilagay niya? And how much can you really write in a blank check, mm-hmm. di ba? So again, I didn't go any deeper kasi baka mabasto siya na talaga, talagang, you know, <laughs> you, you know how much did you write there, di ba? Nakakahiya naman, but I never... See, it must have been 40 years ago yeah. that we had that conversation and still at the back of my mind, it's still a, a, a wonder how can somebody, an artist, be given a blank check, diba? And um, how much could anybody write uh, as an amount there? So that for me is recognition. Yeah. Parang it was, the tone that she had was, uh, kasi hindi na pinagmamayabang. Parang sinabi niya, what? I was given a blank check. So this means you know, I'm somebody or my work is something. It is in that context and in that tone. Hmm. O ganyong tone na, wow, binigyan ako ng blank check na, you know, hindi pagmamayabang. Pero may feeling na, we na-recognize ako. I guess hmm. it's also the the thing that, I mean, today because of the auction frenzy, people are not looking at works. They're looking at price tags and they're looking at labels. And I think Nena was beyond that. Uh, things like, I will do things that I want. Uh, I have enough to live, um, but she she had this uh, she had this sort of contempt for for artists who made a lot of money, uh, and she felt that their work was not uh, worthy of what of what art would be. So I mean, she had she had a different way of looking at things, and I guess it's also her makeup, no, her very monastic makeup. She didn't care if. People didn't buy the. I mean, that's why when you went up that staircase, there were so many unsold works. No, um, but she still continued. And for me, that's the that's the thing. No, yeah, she didn't paint for money or for recognition. Of course, everyone wants to be recognized, but that was that was what drove her. She had to she had to paint. She had to paint these visions of the of the cosmic, uh, without which she would have gone mad. No. Yeah. So we're about to end this uh, conversation, and I hate to, you know, to disrupt it. It's, you know, uh, has uh, brought to the fore so many things to, to think about. But maybe we can end with uh, your responses to uh, the question of character, 
uh, I mean, may nasagil as a person. What was she like? Did she have a sense of humor? Was she warm? Uh, so, how did uh, Nena struck you? How did Nena strike you as a person when you when you interviewed her in in Paris? Maybe we can end with that. Yeah. So we can begin with Sid. Now, just respect. I felt and I knew and I know now that uh, I I saw the life. The, the, the classic story, the classic story of an artist uh, you know, like it uh, was mentioned by Ambeth and uh, Nick. She was not really a materialistic type of person. All these tons, tons of work piled uh, high up on, on uh, inside that little space. And she kept on working, she kept on working. I mean, she, she, um, was this a Van Gogh? But uh, like, it's a classic story. Of an individual, an artist, really willing to die for for her art. So, Nona, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a classic story, and uh, even her life story uh, that that we have been through. You know, her single blessedness, her uh, her being uh, like a religious mystic, a feminist, if you will. Um, she has all these qualities of a classic uh, character. And even then, I knew that I felt that, and but I believe, and I'm glad that you mentioned um, the idea of the first female uh, national artist uh, is really something that is just and maybe should begin to grow, you know, in the minds of uh, uh, you know the 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 the, uh, the authorities, the powers that be, and the, and the ex experts, the specialists. Nena Sagil being the first female Philippine artist. Yeah, we thank you for you. that. I'm sure, uh, yeah, it's about time uh, something happens in that area, no? to pursue the the bid for to make Nena Sagil uh, the first uh, woman. Well, the the, the nice thing there is that she did not change her citizenship, even if her her mm -hmm. life yeah. in Paris was was quite long. No, so uh, mm -hmm. that right. help that helps the whole. I mean, we could not get uh, Anita Magsay Saiho. Uh, that honor simply because she was Canadian, no, and um, mm -hmm. so that's it. And they were classmates, now in the mm -hmm. Philippinesian yearbook of, yeah. of UP. Uh, I mean, the, the stalwarts of the class were Anita and uh, and Nena Sagan. Yeah. yeah. So maybe I'm bet you can talk about. Ah, yeah. Her, just the uh, just the last uh, mm -hmm. is is that no? I mean, the way that I looked at her was, I mean, she's like everyone, every Pinoy's. Um, spinster aunt no uh she she's there no she's warm she would write to you um she would give you i mean like you know we we, we split an egg no i mean it's she would give you from whatever she had no uh, uh, and uh, although she was very serious uh, when she spoke um there was a warmth in her which is why i i continued uh, that friendship i mean Mm -hmm. If she wasn't as warm as she she was, that interview would be the first and the last. But uh, we became mm -hmm. we became fast friends, and uh, I'd like to think that she also drew uh, a lot of energy. I think from young people. Uh, mm -hmm. Nick and I were young at the time, <laughs> and <laughs> she she liked talking to young people. Yes, no? we there, were there, there. there was a there was a little girl who would come to her studio every afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the neighbors with the dog, no, they would come up. Uh, so it, it was that, no, the, what kept her also sociable, and uh, she drew it from she drew it from young people. She didn't really, uh, although she was almost uh, monastic, she she had a, a sociable side when she when she wanted to. But very quickly now, Ambet, uh, how would you explain that? the turn towards Jehovah's Witness. That has been a puzzle to me. Yeah, I never I never understood that also. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, our, what we were all thinking of was, I mean, these were the people who would come in and check on her and uh, eventually took over her life. No, So um, oh. she was, she was uh, 
I wouldn't say she was lonely, but uh, they would, you know, they would do the groceries from her. They would check on her every day. And eventually, they just took over, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, answering the phone, making sure she doesn't go out. And that's what cut me off uh, from her. I'd like to think that if I had been able to get in, then we would we would know what hold this this had on her. On her, yeah. Although I, when I did research in Paris recently, I... I found out that Jehovah's Witness was also quite strong in the strong, city yeah. at that yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, so finally, Roberto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really take this personally, the question you raise, uh, Patrick, because uh, I met Nena in uh, a very crucial point in my life. It was the formative years. All right. I must have been 21 years old. All right. Uh, getting into the world of cinema, mm -hmm. meaning seriously. Uh, you know, uh, getting my formal study uh, and of all places, Paris. I mean, wow. I mean, uh, the, the intersectionality between my yeah. interest in going into film as art, all right, and then having Nena Sagil, uh, the intersection of that, going into or having for my subject an artist who was so serious. Mm. I mean, why Nena? I mean, that's a question that, you know, you just leave it to the higher elements and say, there must be a reason for this. Yeah. I could have done street musicians. Yeah, I could have done uh, Le Marinier, you know, uh, people who, uh, who uh, rode the boats in the River Sien and all that. But no, why of all people, Nena? So my idea of what Philippine art is, what Filipino artists can be, what cinema you know, can be all of this, as I said, intersectionalities came at the, you know, I look back 40 years, you know, from where I am now, and I see that there, there, it, it was the first stepping stone for me, you know, mm -hmm. because Nena never, oh, I'm getting emotional. Nena never left my mind. Nena never left that imprint that she had in me that somebody can exclude her life and live a life of imagination and live a life of spirituality without disavowing the world. Every day she would go, she would cross that, that street in street. Saint Germain, you know, go to the, to the National Library and read and read and read and go to the bush, you know, and go to the, the, to the marketplace and then come home with very austere life. What kind of an artist is this? So that left an imprint in me and for whatever influences it may have to me and to the other artists, I mean, I really thank Nena for that. Yeah, Nena is in your unconscious, uh, Nick, your, <laughs> yes. uh, your own cosmic landscape. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So finally, Sid, yeah, what, how did Nena strike you? No, well, like I said, uh... Uh, I was very objective. Uh, the narrative of her life, and uh, anyone want to be. Uh, Sid, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I have to remain frozen. Okay. Nena is playing with you. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I thought that I was witnessing uh, a classic story of, of, uh, of an artist who was... Uh, I, that was the first time I saw an instance of an artist who saw life, but participated in life, saw life almost to the exclusion uh, of others and, and lived only for, for the arts. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, that was really uh, touching, moving, that one's life can be fully, thoroughly, and satisfactorily lived uh, by one's uh, obsession, passion, enthusiasm uh, for, for the arts. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, so on that note, we'd, I'd like to thank Vargas Museum, would like to thank Ambet Ocampo, Nick Di Ocampo, and Sid Reyes for sharing their time this afternoon talking about 
Nena, this should be the beginning, no? not the end, uh, uh, for more conversations around Nena. We also would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, in the audience of Benjamin and uh, Esther Sagil, the relatives of, of Nena, who also expressed their gratitude to the three speakers. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, we would also like to invite everyone to, uh, to, to support the exhibition Proto Para Rethinking Curatorial Work, although only uh, digitally. So with that, I uh, would like to bring this to a close. Thank you again, Nick, Ambet, and Sid. And uh, thank you all for, for joining us this afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Itay na picture. Hindi tayo nagpicture. Hindi tayo nagpicture. Picture mo na from Bargain. Ayan, nawala. Leia, Leia. Kunan mo muna kami for documentation. Leia, take a photograph of this historic moment. Yeah, it's historic. Leia? Sandali lang. Okay po. Okay, turn your video on. Turn your video on. Hmm. Ay, sir, sige po. Mag, ano na lang, para po kita yung Vargas logo. O, oh, sige. Okay, uh, picture po tayo in 3, 2, 1. One more po. Okay. Ba't hindi namin okay. nakikita? 1, 2, 3. We'll send okay. po the picture later. Thank Can you. We one? Can we have one where in all of us uh, faces lang? Pwede ba yun? Oh. Yes, well, that's, that's the picture I took po. Ah, ganun ba? Oh, oh sige. Uh, really? Kasi we cannot see it. We cannot see it. <laughs> oh, oh. All right. Salamat. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you, everyone. We'll send thank you, Patrick. Thank you, ha? We'll thank send you, everyone. To you. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Salamat, thank you, Patrick. Patrick. Salamat, Margas. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Bye. Bye. Bye.